Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Jack McCullough. With the vision of providing world-class professional development programs and networking events for chief financial officers, Jack founded the CFO Leadership Council in 2006. Under his leadership, the organization achieved national recognition. Formerly, Jack was the director of KPMG's Global Innovation Center, where he worked with early stage investors, entrepreneurs, CFOs, and other members of the venture community. Prior to KPMG, he served as a CFO for 26 startups, raising more than $200 million in capital. In addition, Jack is the visionary behind the MIT Sloan CFO Summit, which has been recognized as the world's most influential conference for financial leaders. As a former chief financial officer, entrepreneur, and recognized expert on financial matters, Jack can empathize with challenges that corporate leaders face in growing today's businesses. In addition to developing a venture capital course for Harvard Business School and MIT Sloan MBA candidates, he has been interviewed by Bloomberg, CNN, Fox Business Network, and quoted by the Wall Street Journal, CFO Magazine, Treasury and Risk Management, the Boston Business Journal, and Business Finance Magazine. Jack holds an undergraduate degree from Suffolk University and an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. He was a Great Dome Award recipient from MIT in 2018. Jack, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. Oh, thanks, Megan. I'm really excited by the opportunity and have been looking forward to talking to you for a while. Yeah, a former chief financial officer, entrepreneur, and recognized expert on financial matters. You are currently the founder and president of the CFO Leadership Council and a two-time author. Today, we're going to hear about your experience, your organization, and your books. And like you, I've been looking forward to this this conversation for quite some time. So let's get started. Sounds great. First, uh, like always, let's start with you and your story as to how you got to where you are today. Okay, sure. And I could go back to the early part of my career, but that's a long, long time ago. Um, But uh, I did go, like a lot of people in my path, I I did graduate college in the 1980s. I worked in one of the big uh, public accounting firms, Pete Mowick and Mitchell, which today is known as KPMG. And then I had a path accounting manager, controller, and a CFO. And in the, uh, about 16 years ago, I was a CFO and I was with a small company and just wanted to establish a peer network of other CFOs, which is why I started the CFO Leadership Council. And, you know, it was a great move. Just when you're a CFO, often you're the only CFO or financial executive in your company, and it can get kind of lonely quickly. So really just the idea of creating a peer network of local CFOs um, led me to start what's now known as the CFO Leadership Council. I had no vision that it would be my job 16 years later, but it is, and I'm loving doing it. 16 years ago, what technology did you use to start that up? Uh, We did stone tablets. Uh, That's how far back. (laughs) uh, No, not quite. But, you know, bluntly, it was just a simple email list. Okay. I reached out. I I know a fair amount of local CFOs, and I live in the suburban Boston area, which you perhaps know that it has a, a big tech area. It's not quite at the Silicon Valley level, but, you know, maybe it's in the tier right underneath. And so there are a lot of software company CFOs in the area. And, you know, candidly, there was no real technology. I, uh, I, I just got in touch with everybody over good old fashioned email. And my first website was, it was called Website Tonight with GoDaddy. I'm not sure if the product still exists, but, you know, the idea was somebody who wasn't very uh, technically astute could launch a decent looking website within a few hours. So, Okay. So as you look back throughout your career, are there stories or career moves that stand out in your mind as as turning points? Yeah, it's hard to say that there was any one or any two, but I I think I've been really fortunate that I've always worked with good people and have had a good relationship with them. When I look back, like my first job out of public accounting, I work for a uh, pre-IPO technology company. And, uh, you know, just I just had a great boss. He was uh, very much a mentor to me. He exposed me 
to a lot of things at a relatively young age, had a lot of faith in me. And uh, he and I are actually still friends to this day. And But I've had, you know, that relationship was certainly a pivotal one in my growth from being an accountant to being a financial leader. And I think along the way, getting an MBA was a big deal as well, because uh, it sort of made me another one of those things that made me not just accounting and finance, but it gave me the whole spectrum yeah. and it made me solve problems very differently. So maybe those two things were significant in my development. But like I said, I, I've just been really fortunate to have worked with some great people over a long career. It's always helpful. And and thanks for your comment about an MBA. It's it's difficult to know if, if that's, you know, it's a lot of money these days and it's difficult to know if, if that's going to have a payoff. So your answer is yeah, interesting. And- yeah, it, it's a lot of money, not only the tuition, which, you know, I haven't looked at in a while, but, uh, you know, it, it's also in my case, it's two years out of the workforce. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's like you, you know, you need to sort of plan if you're like a middle class kid, which I was, you know, you sort of need to plan and save and do those sort of things so that you can survive two years with minimal income. So but, and, and not everybody can do it. Luckily, there's a lot of with executive MBAs and, yeah. and with technology, you can get MBAs from the comfort of your own home and not have to give up your entire career path for a couple of years. And let's talk about your current organization, CFO Leadership Council. So what is it exactly that, that you guys do? Sure. We're a professional association for CFOs. And also, we are open to people who are sort of on the path to becoming a CFO. Okay. So positions like VP of Finance, Controller, and others that you know seem like they might become good CFOs in a couple of years. Uh, we uh, those are our members, and we are probably a um, more than anything. I think we're about a community. We do have world class programs. We have about two hundred and fifty live events per year. And in addition, we have about uh, 25 webinars and a a two-day conference and a lot of stuff. So there's an awful lot of things going on. But by and large, what we are is a community. The the people who are members of the CFO Leadership Council, they get to know each other. They help each other solve problems. and, And that's really what it's all about. And you said you started this up as an email list. When did it become apparent to you that that this could be a full-time job or a full-time effort? Yeah, it, it's interesting, Megan, because I was a little bit slow to figure that out. But um, what happened, it became successful in Boston. And then um, one of our members moved to New York and she reached out to me and asked if I'd consider starting a chapter in New York. And I promptly said no. Um, but, you know, I, I said, I, if you want to start one, I can, you know, let you know what I learned. But, you know, I just don't really have any interest in doing it. And then, but she was a little bit persistent and eventually we started a program in a chapter in New York and then did the same thing in Philadelphia and decided to, yeah, it was the exact same scenario where a member relocated to Philadelphia and he asked to start a chapter. And then, then we decided to open one up in Washington and Atlanta. So all of a sudden I'm a CFO who also has a small business uh, along the East coast and decided to see if we could grow this thing and make it national. And, and I'm glad I did. But a lot of people, apparently smarter than me, encouraged me for a couple of years before I finally figured out that they were right and I was wrong. So. <laughs> and today it's not only national, it's in multiple countries, correct? Yeah, actually, we, are, uh, we have at least one member in every content except, uh, continent except Antarctica. Wow. And uh, I'm such a weirdly competitive person. I actually went on LinkedIn to see if there were any CFOs in it. <laughs> Oddly enough, there aren't. But uh, the, the closest I got, there's a couple in Siberia. Um, so, but if, if I found one in Antarctica, I, I would have offered them a free membership just so I could boast that we're on every continent. So That's funny. And what are your proudest achievements since founding the CFO Leadership Council? Um, boy, there's, um, can I give a couple? Yeah. Sure. There's one that I'd say is ongoing. You know, and it probably repeats eight or 10 times a year, but it, I really love hearing it. It's when a member tells me that he or she got their first CFO job largely because of being a member of the CFO Leadership Council. And, you know, it might have been something they learned, a skill that they developed. More often than it's not, it's a connection that they made or a job that our members shared. And I just love that when I hear about how a controller you know, can learn and build a network and get a CFO job sort of ahead of schedule. You know, I, I kind of like when that happens. And 
I, I guess the other one is back uh, at the beginning of COVID, you uh, you perhaps are familiar with the PPP loan program. Yep. That, um, you know, I, I don't want to criticize the government because they were they were trying to get the money out quickly um, it, while they were basically writing the law. The cliche of building a plane and flying it at the same time applied here. But, you know, there was an awful lot of confusion about it. And we have this tool we call it CFO Connect, where the members can reach out to each other and share knowledge and ask questions and that type of stuff. And at the beginning of PPP, this, this felt like life and death for a lot of companies. The, the members were just, it was phenomenal. They were helping each other because no one really knew anything. And even their, their attorneys couldn't do it. So just the sheer volume of people helping each other. And even like the first couple who got PPP funds, which you know initially was taking two or three weeks, several of them called me up and said, hey, I got my money. Can I do a webinar for your community? And I can tell them what I've learned the last three weeks and see if it helps somebody. And, you know, that's powerful, right? That's that's a real community because you got to wonder what's the rational reason for doing that, right? What's what's in it for them other than to be nice and to help out the fellow members? You know, they weren't getting any, they didn't ask for any money for it or anything like that. And I was just really proud that our members had each other's backs that way. I thought yeah. it was a great thing. That is a great example of how important networks can be. So as yep. you look back on your own career, um, how has having a community helped you? Yeah, it's been critical for me. And again, I, I, I guess going back to the founding of this, you know, if you're, it, I was relatively new in the CFO job I was at, and it's a little bit difficult to come to your boss and say, I don't really understand this, you know? So, you know, that, that doesn't seem like a, a good way to keep your job for very long or go to the board of directors or something like that. So I think just having a trusted peer network where you can bounce ideas and find, you know, solve problems together. I think that is so powerful. Now, of course, if you work for a, a very large company, there might be divisional CFOs, but I always worked for like venture-backed tech companies. So I was really the only CFO or financial leader within the company. So having that network to bounce ideas and, and get wisdom was just absolutely fantastic. And as someone who now has extensive experience, not only as a CFO, but also as a guide to other CFOs, what do you wish you would have known earlier in your career? I think I, I would like to have approached the job with more of a strategic mindset and would have taken more of a, a cross-functional approach to the business. You know, because I, I think early I looked at a company only through the finance and accounting lens. And, you know, I wish I'd sort of put on the strategic hat a little bit earlier in my career. And I will say that the CFOs of today are a lot more strategic than they were, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I, I've even said that, you know, I started my CFO, my first CFO job was the late 90s. I, I think if the pandemic hit around then, most of the CFOs wouldn't have been really as useful in helping their company survive because the the focus was forward, was backward looking rather than yeah. forward looking. But today they're strategic thinkers, they're problem solvers, they understand the whole business. And other than maybe the president and one or two other people, they were the critical reason that a lot of companies survived. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to ask you how you've seen the role of a CFO evolve in the last decade. Maybe you answered it. Maybe, maybe you have a bit more to share. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely... You know, I suppose finance and accounting expertise will always be more, um, you know, a critical part of the CFO role, but it's not enough to do the CFO job well. If you're a really good finance and accounting person, you'll plateau at the controller level or maybe VP of accounting or something like that. No knock on that at all. They're important jobs. And, you know, by the way, they pay really well. But, you know, if you want to be a CFO, you you do need to think of it as cross-functional. Uh, you do need to solve problems. and. Uh, some of the best advice I got was a CFO named Judy Romano. Um, and uh, she once told me she doesn't think of herself as a financial executive. She thinks of herself as a cross-functional executive who happens to be a financial expert. I know the distinction's kind of subtle, but you know it's a great way to think of your role as a CFO that, yeah, you have this financial expertise. You're probably the only one on the leadership team who does, but don't limit yourself that way get out and understand the entire business. And, you know, back in the day that, you know, CFOs were largely accountants. Today, there were more CFOs hold MBAs than CPAs. 
And, you know, that was unthinkable even 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, I'm just curious. Are you seeing CFOs come up through non-traditional routes? Because I've yeah, seen I mean, uh, like engineers, I've had marketing, I've had people with marketing backgrounds on the show. It's interesting to me. Yeah, it used to be, you know, 90% of CFOs were, you know, public accounting controller and, and you know, maybe some other roles along the way. But it usually was, you know, finance and accounting. But you're right. I mean, I know engineers were really good CFOs. A lot of attorneys are CFOs these days. That's happening more and more. And uh, even like there's always been a small number of like investment bankers who've, you know, gone and, you know, usually they're brought in to take a company public. But, um, you know, we're, I'm seeing more and more of that. It's just it's no longer a one size fits all thing. If you have a good leadership skills, a good financial and analytic mind and uh, whatnot, you can be a successful CFO. I um I compared a friend of mine who, you know, she's a, a really good CFO. You, you a football fan by chance, Megan? I know a little bit about it. Okay. So anyways, so she was worried about, you know, can she be a, a, you know, can she go from a good CFO to a great CFO without an accounting background? And, you know, so I, uh, I, I probably make too many sports analogies, but I said, you know, look at, look at Joe Montana. He, he did not have a big, strong arm. What he had was great leadership skills the ability to perform well when the stakes were highest. Uh, he made smart decisions. He threw the ball accurately. And, you know, he was innovative enough. He could, you know, scramble for the first down or just buy time for receiving to get open. And, you know, I think the analogy is similar, right? You don't have to have every one of those skills. You could be missing one or two. But Montana, and a lot of people think, still think to this day that maybe he was the greatest quarterback ever. But, you know, his arm was very average by NFL standards. So I, I told her she, she could be the Joe Montana of CFOs. <laughs> I like which, that Which analogy. she liked hearing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're a football fan, you couldn't care less. But as it turns out, she was. So. <laughs> so what do you think are the biggest challenges facing modern financial leaders today? Yeah, there's one that it's frustrating because it's really about the talent. And, you know, we've been talking about a shortage of talent for 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, it, it actually got worse during a global pandemic, right? So I, I think we ought to just, you know, set the expectation that there is going to be a shortage of talent probably forever, regardless of economic conditions and whatnot. But it's not only the scarcity, it's, you know, the battles of work from home versus returning to office. And uh, for the first time in history, there's a lot of, you know, I think there's like five generations in the workforce as Generation Z begins to emerge and, you know, stake out its claim. And a lot of baby boomers aren't, re aren't retiring on schedule. So, you know, leadership and, and managing talent is a great challenge for CFOs. And then the other one is economic volatility. Um, there's, of all the things that CFOs really don't like, it's a lack of predictability. And, you know, their, their comfort zone is when they can predict they have good visibility into the sales pipeline, into the supply chain, into economic conditions and everything else. And we don't have that anymore. Yeah. Uh, it, we don't have it in the short run, the medium run, or the long run. You know, eventually we'll probably get that back. But it's very difficult to deal with that. And, you know, like inflation, it seems like it's real. You know, I always joke, you, you know, when people say, you know, what can you tell us about dealing with inflation? You know, I always say, geez, it's too bad my parents aren't around. You could ask them because they, they dealt with it their entire life. But it, it's kind of new to me, too. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, on LinkedIn, they, uh, you recently asked CFOs if they think there's going to be a recession. So what was the response to that question? Curious. Sure. The most common response was that people believe that there will be one in 2022. And the second most common is, and it's, it happens to be my own opinion as well, is that uh, we're actually already already in one right now. And recessions, you know, by their nature, you don't know when they've started until after they've started. So, yeah, but, you know, because it's like two quarters of shrinking, shrinking economic growth. But yeah, those seem, there weren't very like many it. people. Yeah, there weren't many people who thought that there wasn't going to be a recession this year. There are a few. And, you know, maybe they're right. But the consensus of CFOs, which is super powerful, um, was that there is there either we're in one or will be in one shortly. And why do you feel like CFOs often have better insights into these types of 
things than economists. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say one CFO has better insights into um, the economy than one economist, but it's, it's sort of a wisdom of crowds type of thing, where if you get a diverse group of CFOs, and by diverse, I mean different industries, different company sizes, you know, different objectives. And if you get 100 of them and you ask them to give their assessment on economic conditions, they're going to get it right because they know their own companies better than anybody. And, you know, cumulative, their cumulative knowledge is more powerful than any economist could really come up with. So I just think they know their the financial and economic aspects of their own businesses than anyone on the planet. So collectively, there's just a lot of wisdom in there that we need to listen to. And let's switch gears now and let's talk about your books. And let's start with Secrets of Rockstar CFOs. So you've talked with more than 40 of the world's best CFOs for that book. And what was the most prominent trait that you found that these CFOs shared? There, it's actually a tie because there were two that every CFO mentioned to me. And the first one we've spoken about a little bit, which is strategic thinking. And it, it might be a little bit overused, but it's no, nevertheless, it's overused because it's true. But the CFO is truly the strategic partner to the CEO. And they're the sounding board. They're the one that's going to challenge him or her. Uh, when they're making decisions. And, you know, the, the CFO is the person that the CEO goes to to talk to. If, uh, the you know, the expression, the emperor has no clothes. Well, if, if that's the case, it's usually the CFO who's responsible for saying that. So strategic thinking is a big, big one. And the other one that, again, everyone mentioned was ethical leadership. And I, I think for the most part, CFOs, it's kind of table stakes that they're ethical. But they're not talking about simply doing their own jobs ethically. It's creating a culture where ethics are valued and important and people live by an ethical code that they follow. And CFOs, uh, along with you know probably senior human resources people, they're expected to be the most honest and ethical people in the company. And they set the example for the rest of us. So I, I'd say those are the big two, Megan. And just curious. Um... Do you do you feel like the CFO is more of a right hand man to the CEO than even a COO? I would say um, yes. I that uh, the, the relationship is a critical one, and in fact, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are actually fewer and fewer COOs these days. Yep. And like at, at one point, every single company in the Fortune 500 had a COO, and you know if they didn't, it's because the person might have just retired or whatnot. Um, but, you know, but CFOs have grown and taken on a lot of responsibilities that used to fall to the COO. But there was a study probably three years ago, and it was by one of the big consulting firms. I uh, Forgive me, I forget which one offhand, but, you know, it was one of the, it was Accenture, I think. Um, but they actually studied sort of executive dynamics, and they concluded that the relationship between the CEO and the CFO is the most important. And this doesn't mean that they have to be golfing buddies or, you know, hang out. Their families need to hang out together on the weekends or anything like that. But just if they're on the same page, they trust each other, they get along well, they support each other. That's a critical thing. And if you don't have that, which doesn't mean the CFO has to be a yes man or a yes woman. But if you don't have that where they're on the same page supporting each other, it, it can get ugly in a hurry is what they concluded more than any other relationship. And from your research, what would you say is the key to success as a CFO? Um, the key to success, I'd say understanding the business. Um, you, you know the expression walking the floor, of course. Yeah, which, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I, I share that with young people. They have no idea what I'm talking about, because, you know, because what's manufacturing, right? But uh, it, it's really, you know, taking the time to understand the business beyond just the lens, lens of being a financial person. And in fact, did you ever see the movie, The Intern with Anne Hathaway and uh, uh, Robert De Niro? I did, yes. Yeah, I, so you, you might remember on the opening scene and you know the characters weren't identified yet, so you didn't know what her role would be in the company, but Anne Hathaway was on the customer support desk and she was calling, I, I think the customer, like there were bridesmaids dresses that were lost or something along those lines. but. Anne got that to prepare for the role, she, and she was the president of the company. But again, as a viewer, you didn't necessarily know that at the beginning. Uh, Anne got that. She actually shadowed several executives to figure out you know, how they approach their job. And 
I've heard, although I, I don't know for sure, but that she actually saw the CEO of Spanx doing something like that, that she would spend like half a day every week on the customer support line, just understanding the business and its customers. Yeah. So, you know, CFOs, maybe you, you should do something like that, you know, interact with the customers pretty regularly. Um, so I would say that would probably be a pretty big thing. And the, the other thing, uh, which a lot of people don't necessarily associate with CFOs, but high emotional intelligence. It's true for all executives, including CFOs, but I've met very few successful CFOs that didn't have a high emotional IQ. Yeah, and that, that's great advice about spending some time on the customer support line because there probably is no better way to know the business and the customers and what it is they want than to spend a few hours on those phones. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the CFOs I interviewed shared that uh, when she got a, a new CFO job, one of the first things she would do is actually to call the CFOs at the five or six largest customers. And she didn't fancy herself doing any selling, simply relationship building and, you know, understanding the dynamic and, you know, what the customer's needs were. And, you know, that's a pretty easy thing to do, right? You know, and call them up once a quarter. And, you know, at the start of COVID, it was probably great to have those relationships in place too, when we were all wondering, you know, what was going to happen next. Yeah. And you also wrote the Psychopathic CEO and Executive Survival Guide. Now, that almost sounds like a joke, but this is actually a real problem. So first of all, let's talk about the problem. How prevalent is it that CEOs are psychopathic? Yeah, it's interesting because there, there is a difference of opinion on the data uh, or whatnot. And it's impossible to get an exact number and have everybody agree on it. That said, the consensus seems to be about 15% of American CEOs are psychopaths. Wow. And what's interesting, that uh, that's basically the same percentage as the prison population. So I, I tell people, I know a guy, he, he works for the state government, and amongst other things, he audits prisons. So when I was doing this research, uh, I told him, you know, when when you go, if you go and visit a prison and do your audit work and you interact with prisoners, and then, you know, later that night, you go to a, an executive meeting with a bunch of CEOs, you're probably dealing with a similar number of psychopaths in each event. So <laughs> but it, it is a little scary when you think about it in those terms, right? That, but they possess many qualities that uh, psychopaths have many qualities that are very useful for being a CEO in the modern business world. Uh, you know, they, they're not necessarily qualities that you'd want in your next door neighbor or something like that. But there's a reason that so many of them achieve success. What qualities are those? Well, yeah, it's interesting because like some of them, you know, the human quality isn't good, but you can understand how it shows up in successful leadership. Like um, one of the main qualities that CEOs do this is just a lack of empathy. They, they sort of don't care about anyone but themselves. Again, I'm not saying this is a nice quality, yeah. but what that does is it does empower them to make unemotional decisions. Every decision is analytical, free of emotion, and you know that's, that's a good way to make decisions in the business world. Uh, the other one, uh, a lot of them have superficial charm, and again, you know, maybe that can be grating if you know them, but in the short run, that shows up as charisma, and people like to follow uh, leaders who have a lot of charisma. Uh, they are, again, they, they have the phrase that uh, clinicians often use is a grandiose sense of self-worth, which I would just call arrogance, but whatever. <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, that's confidence, right? Uh, they're, they're manipulative, but, you know, people are manipulative. If you like them, maybe you just see them as persuasive. So, so a lot of these qualities, you know, when you think about what you'd want in a CEO, you'd probably want somebody who can make unemotional decisions who's a great leader with charisma, has a lot of self-confidence uh, and, and all of these other traits. And, you know, sadly, CEOs do have these in space. And um, I mean, like you said, a lot of CEOs probably possess quality, these qualities or similar qualities. So how, how can people know if, if they are truly working for a psychopath? That's a great question, Megan. And it is one of those things that you'll never truly know. But there's um, like a lot of the qualities that I mentioned earlier, like if, if they just seem to have a lack of empathy, don't care about other people, uh, if they're manipulative, if 
if they lie a lot, that's actually a good thing. If they, um, even things like, you know, people who drive 90 miles an hour, um, you know, sort of a recklessness, that might be a sign that there's a potential psychopath, but it is, you know, pretty difficult to recognize a lot of the, the qualities in them because if they're a CEO, they're smart enough to become a CEO. Um, they're probably pretty good at hiding these qualities from other people, but, um, there's actually a list There's sort of the clinical list. And then there's the list of these are things that I've seen type of stuff. And they do have some tells like a, a lot of times they'll quote great thinkers to justify their positions. Uh, they, they use foreign phrases a lot, yeah, particularly for some reason, Latin seems to be one they, to justify positions. If they don't have a strong argument, they'll like, you know, quote a foreign phrase to make themselves seem smarter. They, they, some of them can be a little bit lazy, so they don't put in effort to learn the business, but they rely on a lot of buzzwords and cliches. So it's sort of difficult for sure to know it, but if you, you think about these things and, you know, they, they, a lot of them just don't have any sense of humor, you know, one by one, you can't say this person's a psychopath because of this. You know, maybe your jokes just aren't that funny, right? Yeah. But you, you know, if they have five or six of these qualities, maybe you ought to, ought to start thinking about, hey, am I working for psychopath, and what does that mean? And what does that mean? What are, what is the key to surviving as a CFO when you work under a psychopathic CEO? It, it's a, a great question because um, you, again, with with fifteen percent of CEOs um, psychopaths. You know, if the average American, I, I think, has something like 11 jobs during the course of their career. Yeah, good so chance really, you'll work for one. Pardon me? You, oh, good. yeah, there's a really good chance. But like, um, it's not all bad. Like, for example, a lot of people have argued very persuasively that Steve Jobs was a psychopath. And would you, if, if you knew Steve Jobs was a psychopath, would you work for him? No, probably not willingly. Yeah, I I would just because I think it would be fascinating even for a couple of years. But, you know, I don't know if he was a psychopath or just kind of a strange dude. But, you know, I'm not qualified to diagnose that. My, I am a business person, not medical. But, you know, you'd, you'd have to say he was an example of a very successful CEO who was potentially a psychopath. And he had, a by the way, he had a great relationship with the CFO. You know, I think what it is, if, if you think the person's a psychopath, which, again, Psychopath doesn't mean evil, right? They just, they're sort of lacking some things. They don't care about other people yeah. and whatnot, but, you know, they might behave appropriately. So if you can get them to sort of focus on the things they're really good at, you know, get that analytical mind going, you know, utilize their charisma while making sure that, you know, they're not making, you know, decisions because of a lack of empathy for other people that they, you know, hopefully that they aren't stealing because a lot of them are dishonest. It can be a working relationship. On the other hand, Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos, you know, again, a, a lot of people think she was a psychopath, but she was an evil psychopath, right? I mean, you certainly would not want to work for her, but, yeah. you know, talk about somebody with a lack of empathy. She developed like a, a blood test kit that fundamentally didn't work and she didn't care. She didn't really try to fix it as much as she should have. So there were two results. People would, you know, take the blood test who were sick but they'd get negative results, which might prevent them from getting the health care that they needed uh, for a while. And then the other way around, people who were perfectly healthy would show up as having a disease that they didn't have. And, you know, that would cause a lot of stress and strain and ruin lives until they got, you know, further diagnosis. But she simply didn't care. She kept selling the product and raising money. Um, you know, Harvey Weinstein, there's another guy. He, um, he, he doesn't think he did anything wrong. Uh, you know, how most normal people would look at him and think he's an absolute monster. He just didn't care because it was all about Harvey Weinstein yep. in his own mind. And both of these books are available on Amazon, correct? If, if people want to learn more. Yes. So lastly, Jack, as a person who runs a group for financial leaders, what is keeping you up or, or your group up at night these days? Yeah, for me, it's, it's probably economic conditions. Like in the past, and, you know, I've, you know, survived a few the the dot-com crash and the financial crisis in 2008 and, and, you know, small recession after that, but they weren't that bad. And, but this one feels like it has the potential to be not only really bad, but to last for a while. 
And, you know, bluntly, there aren't many executives in, in the United States, at least, who survived that. Certainly, I haven't. I've, you know, I've survived six month recessions, not uh, not two year recessions, and they weren't that deep. So I'm very, very worried about the economic crisis not going away. It does seem like since 2020, we've been in this sort of cycle that, you know, we we can't just every now and then something bad happens, right? Um, and, you know, I'm just very worried about how we're going to get our way out of this because there's so many different problems. Yeah. And our so-called leaders in Washington don't seem to be able to agree on how Anything. to solve them. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, you know, and it's, uh, you, you've probably seen that picture of uh, like the six Spider-Mans, each one's pointing at the other one. Yep. It, yeah, it's on Twitter. There's a lot of that, you know, there's there's no baby formula. And, you know, in Washington, they blame greedy business people and, uh, you know, business people blame excessive regulation coming out of Washington and Republicans don't blame Democrats and, and Democrats blame Republicans. And meanwhile, no one's actually trying to solve the problem. So so that's probably my biggest worry that this one feels different than past ones. It could be real and it could be long. Yeah, that's scary. And, and in general, it it is a scary world we're living in these days for lots of different reasons. Yeah, I'm glad I can end your uh, podcast on an upbeat note. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's true, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, on the other hand, you know, I'm optimistic because, you know, we're in an era of innovation. Yeah. And we are just really good at solving problems in the that United is States true. and other places too. So as much as I'm worried about it, you know, I know that we're going to overcome this. Yeah. We always have, and, you know, I think we always will. Yeah, as human beings, we we do cause a lot of problems, but on the on the other hand, we manage to solve almost all of them. So we do indeed. Jack, thank you so much for being my guest today. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure, and hope we can uh, do this again at some point. Yeah, I really enjoyed speaking with you and hearing about all your experiences and the resulting insights. This has been a very interesting conversation. Thank you. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, take care. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Persona. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personive.com. Thanks for listening.